That was then, this is now, chapter eight. I was real hungover the next morning. Besides that, I had to get up early and go to work. Mark woke me up. He was a human alarm clock and never needed more than five hours sleep a night. Me, if I don't get at least nine hours, I feel dead. I felt dead that Saturday morning. I wished I was anyway. I was feeling so bad that I actually stuck a loaf of bread in a grocery bag and dropped three cans of soup on top of it. Bread always goes on top. In a supermarket, this is like the Ten Commandments all rolled into one. It was a wonder I didn't lose my job that Saturday. I carry groceries for this one young housewife type, and when I put the bags in her car, she handed me her phone number. I was feeling so bad, I groaned, Lady, you gotta be kidding. Like I said, it was a wonder I didn't lose my job. It was two in the afternoon before the sound of the cash register quit blasting my ears, And it was quitting time before I finally felt I could eat something. This shows you how sick I was. I had a date with Kathy that night, but she had to work late. I would pick her up at the hospital snack shop at 10. This was fine with me, as I wanted a chance to go look for M&M. Mark knew where where he was. When I got off work, I found Mark sitting in my car. I figured you want to hunt for M&M, he said. How's your head? Better. Man, don't ever let me guzzle like that again. Mark shrugged. You wanted to. You had to get good and drunk because I was cutting Angela's hair off and you couldn't take it. I flipped a remark that I had said many times before, but not to him. Even from my side of the car, I felt him tighten, getting ready to spring. The gulf was between us again. For some reason, I was hacked off because he didn't need to sleep nine hours, because he wasn't hungover. You sound like Kathy, I said. Heaven forbid. What have you got against her anyway? What's she got against me? You're a bad influence. I don't know why I said that, because Kathy sure as hell never said anything like it. Mark was quiet for a minute. Then he said something really rotten. I had it coming for what I'd said to him, but he didn't have to to drag Kathy into it. I gripped the steering wheel. You want to get out of this car and have it out? You don't want to swing on me, do you? It was partly a statement and partly a request. I was quiet. I'm sorry. Mark said, and I kept driving. This was as close as we ever came to having a fight. I followed followed the directions Mark gave me. We went into this old part of town, which used to be a really classy place, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, with these huge old houses that were probably a big deal when they were built. They just looked gloomy now. Most of them were divided into flats. On Mark's say-so, I pulled into a driveway in front of one of them. There was a sign hanging from the porch ceiling that said love in red and green letters. He's here, I asked, because I wasn't sure what was going on. Last time I was here, he was. Mark got out of the car. You can tell when somebody is familiar with the place. Mark had been here many times before. Come on. I got out of the car wondering what in the world Mark could have been doing here. Mark didn't knock. He just opened the front door and walked in. I followed him. The whole inside of the house was freaked out with posters. A girl with long streaked blonde hair wearing blue jeans and a paint splatter shirt was lying on a beat up couch. She had the deadest, most colorless face I had ever seen. Hello, cat, she said to Mark. She knew him. She didn't call everybody cat. Peace, baby, Mark said. I try not to laugh. I dig hippies okay. I mean, they've got some great ideas, but sometimes it was funny. Freaked out, Mark said politely, as if he were saying, how are you these days? Way out, man. She was staring at the ceiling so intently that I glanced up there, just to make sure the answer to the universe wasn't written across it. If it was, I couldn't see it. Maybe she could. Mark stepped over a stringless guitar and went upstairs. I stumbled after him, looking around. Somebody was in the kitchen singing. Each of the steps was painted a different color. It was a good effect, but they were awful dirty. Mark stepped into a bedroom. There were about six or seven kids in it. One kid was lying on a bed watching his fingernails. The others were sitting cross-legged in a circle, talking about some book. I hadn't read it, so I didn't get the conversation, but these kids were not dumb. They were all in blue jeans and old shirts and fringe vests. A couple of them were smoking grass. Hi, Cap, a guy with a beard and a flowered shirt said. I'm looking for Eminem, Mark said. You seen him? Baby freak, he ain't been around today. The kid's flying, man. He's going to crash. You didn't let him take anything, did you? I said. 
This may have been against the house rules, as nobody had said anything to me yet, but this place is getting on my nerves. There isn't any lead in here, this fat chick says. We're free. I looked her over with the practice eye of a playboy and popped off with something really good. Then I raised two fingers and said, peace. This seemed to earn their forgiveness, because they all went back to their literary discussion. Now the kid on the bed was painting his fingernails with green watercolor. On the way out, we passed the blonde chick. She was reading a book and smoking grass. You seen Baby Freak? Mark asked. She shook her head. Sorry. See you around, cat. Even sitting up, she looked dead. When we got back into the car, I said, you dating her? Sometimes. Like the lady said, they're free. I thought about that a long time. I am the first to admit I've got hangups. I don't think I'd ever consider myself really free. But I'm not sure I'd consider them free either. Just because it ain't your bag, don't knock it, Mark said, after we had driven in silence for a while. I didn't say anything. Grass, rum, both are high. Yeah, well, listen, man, rum's gonna maybe get me a weekend in the drunk tank. Grass could get me five years in the pen. That law ain't necessarily right. It's the way things are. I was puzzled. I had never known Mark to smoke pot. I wondered why he was defending it. I don't smoke it, so quit worrying, Mark said, reading my mind as usual. I just don't like to see you judging people. What the hell is bugging you? Oops. What the hell is bugging you? I didn't say anything. Mark was quiet. Then he said, you remember when the socials used to come through here looking for somebody to beat up? Yeah. You remember when me and you beat up that hippie kid in the park? Yeah, I said. I'm a tough punk, Brian, but I ain't dumb. We drove the rest of the way home in silence. I picked Kathy up at the hospital. I didn't tell her about going to the hippie house to look for Eminem. I didn't see any sense in getting her all upset. After all, I hadn't found him. We drove up and down the ribbon, then stopped by the park on the way home. This was becoming standard procedure. I was getting more and more serious about Kathy, and this was really strange for me. I had always had a love him and leave him attitude, even with Angela. I guess it was more a pride thing than a love thing. I still hadn't told Kathy I loved her, though. It was like my never thanking Charlie for letting me use his car. It was something I just couldn't do when he meant anything, when it meant anything. Hey, Kathy, I said while we were on the way home. If I got a ring, would you wear it? Yeah, she said. That's how we started going steady. After I dropped Kathy off at her house, I headed for Terry Jones's place. I was supposed to pick up Mark there, but when I got to the house, nobody was home. Terry's parents were out of town for the weekend, which normally meant it was party and poker time at the Joneses. I figured everybody had gone out scouting for booze and broads, so I sat down on the front steps to wait. It was a cool night, but not too cool. It was getting to be spring. It had been a real weird winter. Last fall, Mark and me had thought just alike as one person. Now we couldn't even talk. Charlie had been alive and griping about our coke bill. I had been a hustler, both with pool and chicks. Eminem had been reading Newsweek and getting his kicks babysitting. Now everything was different. While I was sitting there smoking and thinking, a car pulled up. I thought it was some guys coming to party and so forth, so I didn't pay any attention. The four guys were standing right in front of me before I came two and realized that two of them were Tim and Curly Shepard. I thought you guys were in the cooler, I said pleasantly, just like I didn't know they were here for the sole purpose of stomping out my guts. We're out now, Tim said. He scared me. He was what I would call a rough guy. Curly was mostly mouth, but Tim backed up anything he said. He really was a hood. I know most people call any kid from over here on the east side a hood, but Tim really was. I guess so. I said, still smoking, not blowing my cool. If I kept them talking long enough, maybe Mark and Terry and God knows who else would show up. Seen Angela lately? Tim said. Curly was keeping his mouth shut. Even he was awed by his big brother. There was something about Tim Shepard, his scarred face, his fighter slouch, the flickering of his black eyes, that really let you know he meant business. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I saw her over on the ribbon last night and she went for a drive with me. I decided I didn't need to drag Mark into this. It was plain they weren't worried about him. No kidding. Did you know Angel got her hair cut this morning? At least that's what people say. She told me something different. I was sweating. I could feel it running down my back and wetting my palms. 
and my cigarette was shaking, so I ground it out on the porch. But I sounded calm as I said, what's she telling you? She says you got her drunk and cut her hair off. That the truth? Yeah, that's the truth, and I'm sorry it happened. I decided to tell it straight for once, without all this hedging and playing the game. It was a wrong thing to do, and I'm sorry. You ain't half as sorry as you're going to be, Tim said, and the two guys I didn't know rushed me, pinned my arms, and held me while Tim and Curly took turns punching me. I passed out finally, but not as soon as I had hoped I would. When I came to, Mark was wiping my face off with a wet rag. Brian, you okay? Don't move, man. I bit back a groan because I could tell there were other guys in the room. Normally, I wouldn't have to knock myself out playing the tough guy for just Mark, but I did have a rep to keep. What happened? Who did this to you? Shepherds, I said finally, but it hurt to draw the breath to say it. Something was stabbing me in the sides. My whole face was throbbing and I couldn't open my eyes. They were swollen shut. There was a funny taste in my mouth. I guess it was blood. You want to go to the hospital? Mark asked. He sounded so worried that I felt sorry for him. No, I said. I didn't want to go anywhere. I felt that if I moved, I'd fall apart. Can I stay here? I figured I was in Terry's house somewhere. I could tell I was lying on a bed. Sure, man, you stay here. I recognized Terry's voice. Brother, you look like you've been through a meat grinder. That's what it feels like too, I said, even though this witticism cost me more stabbing pains in my sides. A reputation is one hell of a thing to have. You gotta kill yourself to keep it. I'll call the old lady, Mark said. Then we'll go look up the shepherds. Mark, I said, I wanna talk to you personal life. Sure, buddy. Clear out, you guys. And because he was Mark, they obeyed him. Listen, it hurts like hell to talk, so I'm only going to say it once, and I don't want to argue. Sure. Mark's voice sounded puzzled. I wish I could see him. I knew he wasn't going to dig what I had to say. I could tell he was sitting on the edge of the bed, and I reached for where his hand should have been and caught it. I don't want anybody to fight the shepherds. What? I don't want to keep this up. This getting even jazz. It's stupid, and I'm sick of it, and it keeps going in circles. I've had it. So if you're planning any get even mugging, forget it. I was trying to keep my voice from trembling with pain, but not only did talking hurt my sides, it was killing my face. I got you, Brian, Mark said after a silence. You just take it easy. He left to call mom, and I heard him yelling at the rest of the guys to keep the record player down. He stayed all night on the other side of the bed, guarding me.